Thank you all for standing by and uh, welcome to our webinar entitled Environmental Microbiomes as Indicators of Coastal Lake Erie Resilience. This webinar series called Freshwater Science will highlight Ohio Sea Grant and partnering scientists every month. Every quarter is a different focus from human health and fish farming to harmful algal blooms and human decision making, bringing applied research to the public on issues that affect our Lake Erie communities. I am Jill Gentis Benicki from Ohio Sea Grant and Stone Laboratory. And joining me today is Dr. Tricia Sponbauer from the University of Toledo. Dr. Sponbauer joined the faculty of the Department of Environmental Sciences at the University of Toledo in 2019, and she is currently a resident faculty member at the Lake Erie Center. Before coming to uh, Toledo, she held fellowships uh, from the National Academies Research Associateship Program from the US EPA and the NSF Earth Sciences Postdoctoral Fellowship. Over the last few years, she has grown her research group that is focused on aquatic ecology, molecular ecology, and paleolimnology. Uh, we're delighted to have her here today to talk about her research. Before, but before we do that, uh, just a few mentions about the webinar itself. During our presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Afterwards, around 1220, I'll conduct a question and answer session. If you would like to uh, ask a question, please feel free to open up that chat feature and ask your question at any time. And I'll collect and pose your questions out to Dr. Sponbauer at the end of her presentation. As a reminder, this webinar has auto captioning and is being recorded uh, and will be posted on our website, website for later viewing. Also, we will post a webinar survey in the chat feature toward the end of the half an hour. Please take a few minutes to answer those questions. It helps us continue to bring you great webinars. So without any further delay, I'd like to introduce Dr. Tricia Sponbauer presenting environmental microbiomes as indicators of coastal Lake Erie resilience. Dr. Hello, Sponbauer. Everyone. Thank you so much. Um, uh, thanks for that wonderful introduction. It's a pleasure to talk with you today about the coastal microbiomes of Western Lake Erie. I'd like to thank the conveners of this webinar series for the inv invitation to speak with you today. I'm pretty excited about this research. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. But first, I'd like to thank my partners in this research, Old Woman Creek National Estuarine Research Reserve and the Office of Coastal Management, as well as the Ohio Sea Grant for funding this research. Uh, a few caveats. We are in the process of running quality control and quality assurance on some of these data. Additionally, the overall grant includes both 21 and 2022 field seasons. However, today, uh, the bulk of my discussion will be about 2021. Finally, I'd like to mention that this is limited to information about DNA, which allows us to evaluate community members, but not necessarily whether they were functionally active at our collection times. However, we can still determine functional capacity, which we will find out in a moment, may be very important in our considerations of resilience theory. Now that I have those brief caveats out of the way, I would like to discuss a little bit about what my lab does. We are an interdisciplinary lab that is interested in global change science over a variety of spatial and temporal scales. Our lab specializes in algae and algal dynamics, especially diatoms. The lab is also very interested in molecular ecology over a range of time scales from modern to ancient ecosystems. Most of the ecosystems we work with are large lakes, such as Laurentian Great Lakes. So you can see how the work I will be talking about today, which uses DNA to understand the microbiomes of the Laurentian Great Lakes during a period of rapid global change, fits into that sweet spot of a lot of our lab's interests. As the title of my presentation suggests, I will be discussing resilience. Everyone likely has a working definition in their head of what resilience means, and that definition likely includes the ability to withstand perturbations and disturbances. However, when we talk about ecological resilience, we need to add specificity to our definition that includes both the ecosystem and its response to the environment. You can think of um, that response as the driver of perturbation or the disturbance that is occurring. In the schematic you see here, the ball is the ecosystem and the depression the ball sits in is how much resilience the system has. However big that depression is can be considered the resilience of the ecosystem. If that depression is really large, the ecosystem has a lot of resilience and disturbance will move that ball around the cup, um, but it will always return to equilibrium. 
But if the resilience is lessened, our depression is smaller and disturbances can cause the ecosystem, here still depicted as that ball, um, to move from one state to another. And these states, the depressions or cups in the diagram, each have their own sets of structures and functions. You can think of these structures as things like community composition and functions as rates of photosynthesis or heterotrophy. Here, um, we are also members of ecosystems and we rely on ecosystem services and ecosystem services are part of the underlying structure and functions um, that define an ecosystem state. So here you can see how ecological resilience or how big that depression of that cup is has important implications for ecosystem services and health. This slide is similar to the previous one with the exception that it shows not only a high resilience system and a low resilience system, but also a system with high adaptive capacity. I'm adding information about adaptive capacity because it gives us an idea of how to manage for resilience. When we have high resilience defined as high diversity or functional groups, um, that can stabilize an ecosystem. When we, when we have low resilience, these systems don't have the adaptive capacity to be stable. Okay, now with that background material sorted, we can start to delve into what resilience means in the Western um, basin of Lake Erie and how micro microbiomes might help in understanding these dynamics. This work was largely done by my graduate student, Alyssa Armstrong, who led the field work in 2021 and 2022. Also a lot of the bioinformatics that you will see today was led by my PhD student, Shan Thomas. The choice of using environmental microbiomes has several benefits in that it will help us to characterize the lower food web, allow us to develop bioindicator species, and determine the community's structure and function along the coastal areas of Western Lake Erie. Environmental DNA broadly is the methodology that we use to collect the materials needed to conduct our assessment of environmental microbiomes. Environmental DNA is defined as a collection of live and dead genetic material from the environment. Our study was carried out in a west to east transect along the western portion of Lake Erie. Our sampling locations extended from the mouth of the Maumee River along the coast, past the islands to the easternmost point at Old Woman Creek National Estuarine Research Reserve. This transect encompasses many different types of land use from intensive agriculture to restored wetlands to intact estuarine areas. The entire transect is about 80 kilometers and we sampled these nine sites monthly during 2021 and 2022 from May through September. Today, I'll be discussing that 2021 data set. I've used the term environmental microbiomes several times without a clear definition. So uh, let's get that straightened away. Um, for our study, the environmental microbiome includes everything above 10 microns, which targets both eukaryotic and prokaryotic microbiota. Within the groups are algae, zooplankton, large bacteria, and bacteria associated with particles larger than 10 microns. This community makes up the foundation of the food web, and I will use these figures throughout the talk to orient you to the type of community I'm discussing. We collected water samples along the coast of Lake Erie using an integrated water sampling technique to ensure that we evaluated the entire water column in our study. Those water samples were then concentrated for analysis. When we were collecting water samples, we also collected ancillary data, including nutrient data, secchi depth, and other chemical, physical, and biological measures with a sond. These data will help us to determine if there are chemical or physical parameters that drive our community composition through space and time. Let's start discussing the results. Here are three of the nutrients that drive most of the variability in our nutrient data set. This is a fairly information rich graph. So I'm going to walk through each part. On the Y axis, you have dissolved silica. And on the X axis, um, you have at the top, you have months. And at the bottom, you have sites one through nine. Um, so the higher the dot, the more dissolved silica present in the sample. Next, each one of those dots is a different color. The redder the dot, the higher the nitrate concentration. The bluer the dot, the lower the nitrate concentration. Finally, the size of the dot shows how much dissolved reactive phosphorus each sample has. You can see that nutrients are generally correlated. The larger redder dots are generally higher on the y-axis of the graph. An additional takeaway from this slide is that sites one and two generally have the highest value of nutrients. These are the sites closest to the Maumee River, a major region, region for nutrient loading. These data sets will be used to help us to describe the bi microbiomes in the next several slides. Here I'm sharing the diversity of the bacterial community by month. You can see that there is a trend in these data, but considering their standard deviation, they have very similar diversity across time. And the diversity across space also appears to be very similar. 
Okay, let's now delve into what an entire community looks like across space and time. Here we have the most abundant phyla of bacteria. That's a high level of taxonomic organization that's above species, genus, and family. At the top of the graph, you can see that samples are divided by site, at the bottom by month, and then all of the phyla here are on the left-hand side. The more yellow a box appears, the higher the abundance of that particular phyla. Um, and the bluer it appears, the lower the abundance. If there's a gray box here, um, that means that that phyla was, phyla was not present in a sample. Um, so unless you're a pro at microbial taxonomy, this may not mean a whole lot. So instead of looking at species, let's look at function. Here we can evaluate these samples by their functional capacity. On the left-hand side, you see a broad list of categories, and then on the right-hand side, specific functions. Um, in our data set, we find quite a bit of functional capacity for photoautotrophy and chemoheterotrophy. Those are the bacteria that are getting energy from sunlight and carbon consumption, respectively. However, we also see some nitrogen cycling potential here in this area and some um, carbon cycling potential. Um, and then we have this one kind of very odd site that has a lot of um, diversity in its functional potential here at site, si site six in the month of May. These are the types of functionality we are looking at when we start to consider the functional diversity aspect of resilience in these ecosystems. We can also visualize these major functional groups by how much they correlate to nutrient concentrations and physiochemical parameters. In this heat map, the redder a square, the higher the Pearson correlation needs is. That means that they are both sort of increasing in the same direction. Conversely, the bluer the square is, um, the more negatively correlated they are. Stars within the boxes indicate statistical significance. Here we see things like intracellular parasites correlate highly with temperature and functions like chemoheterotrophy correlate with nitrate. Again, I'd like to caution that each of these functions are not necessarily occurring at the time of sampling, but species detected are predicted to have these functional capacities. The correlations between physiochemical parameters and functions allows us to understand what locations and seasons are more likely to produce communities with um, the capacity for a diversity of functions. Okay, we also conducted an indicator species analysis. Here we are looking at those genera that indicate warm periods, they're in pink, and those um, uh, that indicate cooler periods, those are in blue. The warm periods we predefined as uh, June, July, and August, and uh, the cooler periods as May and September. This, allow this type of analysis allows us to look at the genera that are indicators of different environmental parameters. Here we see that genera like Ludilibacter are indicators of cold temperatures, whereas genera like Megaria are indicators of warm temperatures. So here and here, the cold one and the warm one. Okay, so this diagram shows a cluster analysis. Those samples that cluster together on the dendrogram are more similar. You can think of this dendrogram similar to how you would think of a family tree. Those samples that are next to each other are generally more similar, like sisters or siblings. And here we see that some sites cluster together. For instance, there's a grouping of seven here in this uh, cluster analysis. However, if we were to look by month instead of site, we see much better clustering. You can see that most months clustered pretty well together on this dendrogram. This is a very interesting result um, and one that we will see the opposite when we start to consider the microbial eukaryotes, which I'm gonna talk about next. So this is the uh, microbial community, uh, eukaryotic uh, microbial community. Here is a bar graph showing the top 20 most abundant genera from the microbial eukaryotes. Um, here you will see both algae, so genera like Thalassiosira, Olicocyrus, Ratium, and zooplankton, genera like Daphnia, Basmina, Leptodiaptimus. Again, this diagram is grouped by month at the top and site at the bottom. There's a lot going on here, so let's break it down by month. And in each one of these diagrams, I'm going to have the bar graph as well as um, the nutrient um, information from that, that um, month. In May, we see that Daphnia, a zooplankton, and Cyclotella, a diatom, dominate most of the sites. Those are these green bars here. Um, however, site one and site two also have a lot of Skeletonema um, and Thalassiosira. Those are actually two genera that you don't find in the Western Basin, uh, but we find closely related genera that are not in these databases. It's a little kind of tricky thing you need to kind of know what's closely related, but um, 
Anyway, these are this is also a time period where we have sort of high nutrients at site one and site two. When we move to June, there's a more even distribution of genera um, and the and we also start to have this appearance of Alakasira in our data set from at sites three through five. In July, we sampled to a relatively clear phase, despite some of the highest readings for some of our nutrients. This clear phase was dominated by zooplankton like Daphne and calanoid copepods. Uh, in August, during the cyanobacterial bloom, most algae were gone from the community composition of um, sort of these microbial eukaryotes uh, because all of our cyanobacteria reads are actually in with the other data set. So here we see mostly um, copepods at site one through seven and then bosmina at sites eight and sites nine. Um, and you can notice that there's much less nutrients at this time period. Okay, in September, our nutrients rebound and we have a heavy return of diatoms in our flora showing large abundance of Alcacyra, Cyclotella, and Actinocyclus here at the top of the graph. Okay, similar to how we looked at functional types and environmental factors with our bacterial data set, we can do a similar type of analysis with major groups of microbial eukaryotes to see if they are correlated with environmental factors. Here we see things like cyclops, as zooplankton being fair, fairly highly correlated with depth, as well as a rotifer, highly correlated with turbidity. These types of relationships start to help us to understand the drivers within our system. Understanding the drivers and their impacts on the structural and functional diversity in an ecosystem allows us to begin to characterize the ecological resilience. All right, so we're gonna go back to that cluster analysis, similar to how we did um, on that bacterial community. When we ran this cluster analysis, we found that sites clustered together pretty well, and that time really showed no pattern at all. Um, so I wanted to end there because how these samples are clustered, whether by time or space, was one of our major findings. Interestingly, we found that month clustered our samples for our bacteria better than site, um, but we found the opposite for the microbial eukaryotes, um, which our samples were clustered by site better than time. We also found a suite of organisms that were correlated with physiochemical parameters and nutrient concentrations. Further, we found some functional capacity differences among sites, which is a very interesting area for continued research. There is a lot of work yet to be done on this data set. Moving forward, we'll be finishing our QAQC, analyzing 2022, comparing variation between years, and looking at the networks that are set up between microbial eukaryotes and their prokaryote consortium. All right, so I'm just gonna take a couple um, more minutes to uh, talk about a community-based science program that was nested within the larger Ohio Sea Grant funding. This project was begun by an undergraduate student, Megan Ginther, who is now lab tech in our group. Erie DNA is an initiative to integrate the community into collecting environmental DNA samples. The heart of Erie DNA is bio blitzes that are conducted within the Lake Erie watershed. The advantage of this technique is to have community members participate in broadening our collection scope while educating a broad audience about environmental issues in the region. The intention is to bridge the knowledge gap between community members and scientific researchers. While most of our collection happens during BioBlitz events, there are also kits that community members can check out, to collect water, filter that water, and then return it to us for analysis. And the methods of Erie DNA uh, follow exactly the methods that we use in the lab to process all of our samples. Um, this has been a great opportunity to integrate community partners in understanding our Lake Erie watershed. Here you can see college students from the University of Toledo learning how to filter DNA from water in the field. Currently, we have collected DNA through this program for more than a dozen sites in the Lake Erie watershed. Here you can see a map of some of those locations, included are places like Howard Marsh Metro Park, Stranahan Arboretum, and Lake Erie itself. We have many partners from TEMACOG to some local fire departments to sailing clubs in the Department of Environmental Sciences at the University of Toledo. Some of our early outcomes for this program is standardized protocols for sampling and lab protocols, a dedicated webpage for Erie DNA, the first sequencing results, which we've made available to the public in um, the next couple months. And this is an ongoing project and we welcome additional partners or community members that would like to sample water near them. Okay. so. Thank you for listening. I, that was a lot of information. I'm very happy to take uh, questions for as long as people want to hang out. My contact information is here on the bottom of this slide. Feel free to reach out if you're interested in either the microbiome work or Erie DNA. Um, yeah, and I'm happy to take any questions now too. All right. Well, thank you. We've gotten some great questions uh, during uh, Dr. Spahnbauer's presentation. So let me start asking as many as we get to. Um, 
one of the first questions we had gotten was um, wanting to know a little bit more about why is this research important uh, to, to really, this is such a different type of research that we had a couple of people <laughs> asking like, why is this really, why is this really important to know? Well, lots of different reasons. Um, and I'll go through a couple of them. Uh, what happens at the micro scale ends up scaling up through the food web, basically. So if we have robust um, zooplankton populations, that helps sort of, we have a very productive Western basin, both in you know, algae, zooplankton, and also fish. So that all sort of amplifies through the food web. So yeah, there's there's a food web application of this work. There's also just an indicator application of this work. So I talked a little bit about warm temperatures versus cold temperatures, but you could really sub in anything there. If you had um, a combination of nutrients that you were interested in looking for, you could look to see you know, what um, are good indicators of a certain condition, which is um, bioindicators are, have been used throughout time to sort of give us an indication of ecosystem health. Then there's also um, all of those sorts of things that um, for this study were bycatch, but might be interesting to, you know, both the types of organisms that might be bad for us. So those ones that we're really familiar with, toxin producing organisms, but also those things that might be pathogens um, or fish, fish pathogens. Um, invasive species, we have spiny water flea in, in the, these data sets. Um, as well as maybe you know endangered species. So there's lots of things that environmental DNA is very good at collecting, um, which might not have been the exact aim of this, but we still got it because of bycatch. But then there's also just the sort of what happens at the foundation of the food web, the microbial functions really permeate throughout the entire food web. I hope that answered it. Yes, it did, thank you. Um, we had a question uh, dealing with um, for HABs, the goal is to reduce phosphorus loading in the spring. What effect would this have on the microbial community? That's a really good question. I mean, I'm thinking really hard about that because uh, I could see a lot of different things that could happen. Um, but mostly, and especially in this data set, we have a lot of heterotrophs. So, right, like the heterotrophs are eating biomass that's out there. So, when you have a less productive um, basin, so when you move from like a eutrophic system to an oligotrophic system, you also lose biomass of the heterotrophs. Um, so that's a possible outcome is that we might like lose a bit of that diversity that comes along with that, but that's sort of a, a balance, right? And we could definitely you know, probe this data set for those things that sort of co-occur with the cyanobacteria. Um, and that work is you know sort of out there, like the, the consortium that is, specific to cyanobacteria sort of are already out there. Um, and so getting an idea of what would also be lost is just those things that are, are eating biomass. Um, but as you can see, there is a lot of different players even should like some cyanobacteria go away, there's opportunity for other sort of algae to rebound and depending on the sort of stoichiometric balance of each algal species out there that they need, they might fill that niche if phosphorus goes down. And stoichiometric balance is just like the recipe the algae needs to grow. Um, fancy word for that. So, you know, there might be if phosphorus goes down, something that can outcompete in that situation and, and might take over a role um, that might might be beneficial. That's hard to predict, hard to predict, but 
Yeah. All right. Um, another question that we had was um, if there is an impact on microbiome uh, resilience, what was the cascading impact on your zooplankton? Hmm. That's a fantastic question. Um, and this is sort of like research to like stay tuned for, because really what we did was isolate the analysis for the 16S, which is sort of the bacteria analysis and the 18S. So we know right now how those things are changing independent of each other. And you might've noticed on that like future work slide that like understanding the network di dynamics of like what happens in those co-occurrence matrices when things go up and down. Um, that is very much what one of our questions are sort of moving forward. We do see that space structures the zooplankton largely more than time does in this data set right now. Um, so it it's hard to say if those things are going to move in tandem because time was really the overarching um, driver in the, the 16S. But my best answer is stay tuned. That is a question we're very interested in. Um, yeah, and I'd be happy to talk with anybody about about that and and approaches for it, but right now we're looking into some network analyses to kind of disentangle that. All right, and I wanted to mention to uh, folks that I'll be sending out that email with the recording, and I'll also add Dr. Spon Baller's email in there so you can uh, directly talk with her about some of your questions. Um, another question that we had was. Um, Specifically, I, I, we had one person ask um, why that area for monitoring and sampling. Um, and then also another person asked, um, could the monitoring and sampling be extended to the Swan, Swan Creek watershed um, as large as Ottawa River watershed in urban? Yeah, um, we picked our sampling sites based on, oh, based on a lot of different things, <laughs> but um, basically land use, um, so adjacent land use. Uh, we also picked our sites on where there has been habitat um, studies done for fish because we wanted to make sure we want to be able to eventually look at how the lower food wide lower food web dynamic might be impacting the upper food web dynamic so we used um a bunch of habitat suitability fish habitat suitability for some of our sites and then some of those sites we wanted to have like a little bit of overlap with other monitoring that's going on in the lake erie um you know, western portion of Lake Erie. So sites somewhat overlap with Dr. Bridgman's sites and I think a couple overlap with NOAA sites as well. So we wanted to use some areas that had history of monitoring as well as some areas that um, we might be able to start to connect that lower food web to the upper food web. Oh, Swan Creek. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we actually have a couple Erie DNA samples from Swan Creek from our, not in this last batch, but in this next batch, we've been really increasing our coverage through this community science um, project, getting out into other areas that weren't part of our, our monitoring specifically. All right, uh, another question that we had um, was, are there any correlations or key findings from the HAB severity versus uh, eukaryotic micro, microbiome, especially in the Western sites? Um, yeah, so this is a really interesting question when we start to analyze our 2022 data set, because then we have like two years in which we can look at have severity and then see how things are, are responding. Um, but I can tell you like off the cuff from the 2021 season, we see, and this is not unexpected, we see a real big drop in all of our other 
uh, algal types. And this is usually like often seen in fluorometer work that's done out in the Western basin where, you know, moving up to HAB season, there might be a balance of um, lots of different types of algae. And then, you know, once the HABs kick off, the others really have a hard time competing. Um, not all years, but some years, that's definitely the case. So we definitely see that in our data set where we lose a lot of our algae. And we also seem to have a pretty different suite of dominant zooplankton at given times too. So there's definitely a signal that makes July very different than most of the other months in our data set, but um, sorry, August. Um, July is pretty different too, because we did have kind of a bit of a clear phase at that time period and then ramped up to August, um, which was, you know, sort of bloom dynamics. Um, I hope I answered that question, but also that's something that we'll be looking at when we, we just have our 2022 is, is just been sequenced. So we're just getting through some of that data. And I think when we have the ability to look at two different years have severity, we can start to disentangle like what we can learn about have severity compared to these microbiomes. Um, could you talk a little bit uh, more about the, your analysis part? What specific pipeline taxonomic database did you use? Yes, we used um, data to implement it in R um, for our denoising. We used PR2 for 18S and Silva for 16S. Those are the databases. Then we used a whole suite of um, R packages for all of our sort of correlations and our um, Pearson you know, correlations as well as uh, predicting functional types. And I'm happy to get that list um, out to whomever is interested. Uh, but that's sort of like a broad overview is, is our entire pipeline is R based, uh, implemented with data to upfront. Um, our, our, what we queried our um, taxonomy with was PR2 and um, Silva, and then, then a whole bunch of different R packages for sort of the data analysis aspects. All right, we've got a couple more questions. So if you're okay with staying yeah. on for a few more minutes, fantastic. Um, one question we had was, could you talk what was what are the main factors that you saw as the biggest drivers for the differences? Location, time, temperature. Um, Maybe this is more of a general question, but they were really interested in wanting to know what those drivers were that were was were causing the differences. Um, so really good question. Um, for bacteria, it appeared that time mattered more than it did for the um eukaryotes, microbial eukaryotes, where site mattered more for those. Um, I personally, this was sort of my like, a little bit of my anxiety going into this talk is I haven't figured that out. Um, and that's gonna take a little bit more of like parsing exactly what's going on there. It could be that the reads in the bacterial data set are so driven by the bloom and ramping up to the bloom and after bloom that that's why time matters more to the uh, microbes. Of course, we do see correlations with some types of functional groups in the microbes with things like nitrate concentration um, or things like temperature. Um, when we get to the microbial eukaryotes, that is driven a little bit more by sight, but not as not as clearly as as sort of the the sixteen S data set. Um, and there you have a pretty clear like mommy river, uh, a lot of like everything up to the islands. Islands are different. And then uh, sort of like 
Old Women Creek and the site right next to Old Women Creek. It almost kind of divides up into those groups um, of what the sort of zone. And I think that's largely driven by the zooplankton on the eastern side of that transect and then uh, like diatom abundances on that sort of western side of that transect. Um, and I think that that is largely probably nutrients. Um, I think that silica probably plays a role for those diatoms um, at various points and times in the Western Basin. And I, and like, I believe that like, you can even see silica kind of get drawn out of the system at the same time that there's the cyanobacterial bloom. So it might be like a one, two punch for um, bloom dynamics um, there. The zo zooplankton, um, I've seen a little bit of turbidity um, drive some of that community. So perhaps it's just like you get clearer and you get a different community set up to the east. Um, yeah, I guess those are like sort of like the preliminary things I've been kind of seeing from the data set. But uh, yeah, that's that's probably where I'll leave that. Okay. Um, two last questions. Um, sure. What are, are you... Are you considering, are you factoring impacts from climate change into mm. um, into uh, your considerations of ecosystem resilience? Uh, not too much in this study, but a lot of my lab spends a lot of time thinking about climate change. And that's where the paleo part of all of my stuff comes in. So where we can get a little bit deeper time perspective on um, how changes impacted lakes. Um, and this, this data set is interesting to me on so many different levels. So like on this sort of like coastal resilience level, um, the phytoplankton dynamics level, but then also like we have a very, we measured a lot of different physiochemical parameters and nutrients when we were taking these data so that we can start to understand like what hot periods look like, what cold periods look like, what periods of in intensive um, nutrients look like. So if we ever do try to reconstruct what climate change has done, or if right now it's different than it was in the past, we have a really great training set from this these data, um, which is, I think, a really nice added bonus um, to this, this study. But yes, I'm very interested in, in what climate change on top of sort of the other multi-stressors that, you know, the lakes um, are undergoing might be doing to these communities. All right. Uh, one last question. Um, any ideas if the temporal effects associated with bacteria are also present in benthic communities? Mm. That is such a good question. I'm gonna just be completely honest and say that I am not, I am not, I, I spend most of my time in like the free floating land of the, the pelagic zone. Uh, I suspect so. I mean, right, these cyanobacteria are hanging out somewhere in the, not bloom time. So I bet there's some, some over, I bet there's some temporal aspects to benth the benthos as well in the bacteria. Um, again, this study was May through September. And I bet even when you get into the colder months, for sure, for sure, different processes and different functional groups are taking over. So my very not educated answer for that is likely, um, but really good question. I'm gonna have to think about that a little bit. <laughs> All right. Well, I think you're gonna get some emails from several <laughs> folks as they've yeah. been saying they're gonna be emailing you on a couple of things. Um, so um, I did. I realized the time. Um, so anyone who has those questions, feel free to email uh, Dr. Spombauer. I will send her email. It's there on the slide, but I will send it also in the email with the recording, um, hopefully within the next hour. Um, so 
with that, um, I wanted to again thank Dr. Spahnbauer for her willingness to talk to her about talk to us about her research. This has really been a great discussion. So thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Uh, I did want to remind everyone that the survey URL is in uh, for this webinar is in the chat feature. Uh, please take a few minutes to fill that out. Uh, this webinar series is sponsored by Ohio Sea Grant, and we'll continue in November with. Uh, the University of Toledo's Emanuela Gianfrido, who will be uh, talking about her research on pharmaceuticals and PFAS contamination. Uh, the registration link is in the chat. Uh, again, thank you, Dr. Spahnbauer, for uh, your willingness to talk with us today about your research and all the participants on this webinar. This has really been a great discussion. We hope this was beneficial and hope you, that you'll join us again in an upcoming webinar. Thank you again and have a great afternoon. Thanks, Dr. Spahnbauer. Thanks so much.